Darwin was a very bitter man, and very bitter at God, and then denied his faith, and then came up with this fairy tale for grown-ups. Well, the reason they're so uh, angry about it and so defensive is because the theory has so many holes in it, and it's such a weak theory. What evolution do we have? What can we see? What, do, what examples do we have of evolution, regardless of the conditions, fast or slow? Please name your best one. Science has never found a genuine transitional form that is one kind of animal crossing over into another kind, either living or in the fossil record. Hey there, because I'm tired of hearing stuff like this and because in the comment section of my own videos I often see creationists trying to argue that there is no proof for evolution, I decided to make a video pointing out the main evidence for evolution and why evolution is, without doubt, a reality, whether you like it or not. So let's get started. This is a song about some kids Chris. Lord save us, she's an atheist. The main mechanism of evolutionary change is natural selection, which was first proposed by Charles Darwin. The idea of evolution existed before, but nobody managed to present a plausible mechanism for it. Until Darwin. In the natural world there is a constant, undeniable fight for survival, and the organisms which have the most suited for survival traits will be the ones to pass those traits to the next generation. And so the average characteristics of a population will change over time. And given a very long period of time, this can result in very dramatic changes. This is natural selection in a nutshell, and there is evidence for it all around nature. To give an example, some microbes have evolved resistance to certain antibiotics. That's because every once in a while there are a few microbes which either have already or develop later due to a mutation a genetic difference that makes them resistant to the drug. They pass this trait to the next generation, so the resistance to the drug spreads to the population. And we learn this the hard way because the cost in human life is very high because of infections caused by bacteria that evolve resistance to one or another antibiotic. Natural selection is also ever so evident in the observed speciation. For instance, the California salamanders, which became separated geographically and evolved to adapt to different environments. The salamanders on the forest region relied on camouflage, while the ones on the coast adapted to display a coloration of dangerously poisonous newts to keep predators away. And so these salamanders are now so different, they are on their way of becoming different species. Homologies refer to similar structures in different organisms. For instance, the forelimb in tetrapods, which is made from the same set of skeletal bones. We have a long bone in the upper arm, then two bones in the lower arm, then a bunch of small bones in the wrist, and then a set of five digits. And if you look at any other tetrapod, even if their forelimb is used for different things, whether it is the wing of a bat used for flying, or if it's the flipper of a whale. They all have the same bone structure as our forearm. And some of those animals lose some of their digits in various stages of development, like we can see in birds. This would make no sense unless you consider a common ancestor. Otherwise, why would that be? Why would birds initially develop five digits, if they only needed three? And this is very evident with embryology. For instance, the presence of limbs in dolphin embryos, which are virtually identical with the arm and leg buds in human embryos, or the tail in human embryos. These features are normally observed in later development, but the fact is, embryos display traits characteristics in their ancestors, and again, this makes no sense except in an evolutionary context. Why do birds have genes for making teeth? Why do dolphins have genes for making legs? And since we're talking about this, why do we have a muscle to move a tail? Just like monkeys do, if we don't have a tail. Which brings us to atavisms. An atavism is the reappearance of an ancestral feature that disappeared generations ago. For instance, chicken born with teeth, or hind legs in snakes, or human babies born with a tail. This doesn't happen often, but those anomalies occasionally occur because the ancestral genes are still present. Now, at the time when The Origin of Species was published, Darwin admitted there are some gaps in his theory. For instance, there were not that many known fossils to support it, and indeed the fossil record in Darwin's time was quite limited, and the dating was imprecise. But the fossil record grew significantly since then, and new fossils are found every day. We can now accurately date them and put them in very precise periods of time. Creationists love to throw around the very famous and overly debunked claim that there are no intermediate fossils after naming them missing links. Well, such claim is ignorant on its own, because every fossil is in fact a transitional form. What they mean is fossils that present clear features found in both the classes of animals they are transitioning. 
This is Archaeopteryx, a very primitive bird which lived in the late Jurassic. Actually, it's the oldest bird known so far, and it shows clear transitional characteristics from dinosaurs to birds. In some of the fossils, we can actually see the presence of feathers, clear indication that this animal was a bird. But in addition to the feathers, there are also reptilian characteristics, including a long bony tail, clock fingers, and teeth, which none of the modern birds have. Ambulocetus is a transitional form from land mammals to whales, an animal that could swim but also walk. Its periotic bones are structured like those of whales. From the nose adaptation we can see that it could swallow underwater, and the teeth are very similar to those of whales. Tiktaalik is a beautiful transitional form from primitive fish to early tetrapods. And there are plenty, plenty of other examples. But what I want to stress again is that all fossils are transitional forms. And there are also many fossils of evolutionary intermediates of hominids, showing gradual change from Lucy three million years ago to other species of Australopithecus, to Homo habilis, to Homo erectus, to archaic Homo sapiens, to modern Homo sapiens, which is us. And anyone can read and learn about them, even see them for themselves in museums, provided, of course, they are willing to. Another problem Darwin saw in his theory was heredity. In his times, it was thought that the traits from both parents blend into the offspring. And this would present a problem, because if a certain advantageous trait was to appear in an individual, it wouldn't be passed on as it is, but it would blend in with the traits from the other parent. And so it would fade away through generations, and the species would remain fairly stable. Again, this is what it was thought of heredity at the time. Now we know that this is incorrect. The discovery of DNA in 1953 has demonstrated that heredity fits evolution perfectly. Now we know exactly how it works. While some of the traits are blended, many are not. Furthermore, along the way in the process of reproduction, DNA is subjected to mutations. Some of those mutations produce traits that are benign. Some of them are harmful. For instance, a shorter tail in a feline that needs a long tail for balance. But occasionally, some of the traits are beneficial to survival. For instance, a variation of spots in the coloration of a feline that provides a better camouflage. And those traits are passed on. Genetics explain how the new traits appear. Darwin did not know that, and he had no idea how they were passed on. And yet, with the discovery of DNA, his theory became stronger than ever. Even more so, genetics prove beyond doubt that we do share a common ancestor with the great apes. While the cells of all great apes contain 24 pairs of chromosomes, the human cells contain 23 pairs. So, if we do have a common descent, we would find in our genome a fusion between a pair of primate chromosomes. On the end of every chromosome, you find genetic markers called telomeres. In the middle, there are different genetic markers called centromeres. But if a mutation caused a pair of chromosomes to fuse, we should find telomeres not only on the ends, but also in the middle of the chromosome. And not just one, but two centromeres. And that's what we find in our chromosome number 2. All the markers are there. It was formed by the fusion of two primate chromosomes. This is the nail in the coffin proving a common descent. Another gap in Darwin's theory, at the times when he wrote the book, something that was quite a problem for him, was if there had been enough time for all this variety and diversity of life to have evolved. You see, in the times of Darwin, the estimated age of the Earth was about 20 to 200 million years. And he expressed his worries that this probably wasn't nearly enough time for natural selection to do all this. And this problem has now been solved. We now know that the age of the Earth is about 4.5 billion years, and living things have been on Earth for about 3.8 billion years. That's plenty of time. To sum all this up, since Darwin's death, the fossil record grew and improved, with each new discovery to further confirm evolution. With the discovery of genetics, we learned that heredity works exactly as needed to support his theory. We learned that the Earth is old enough for natural selection to produce all the diversity of life seen today, and now we even have the technology to study natural selection as it happens. And in all this time, not one piece of evidence was found to contradict evolution. And still, there are so many people who just won't accept it. And I know why, because for most of them, Accepting that all the life there is today came about through a natural process implies that there is no need for a creator god, that evolution takes god out of the picture. And if you feel that way, that's too bad, but it doesn't change the facts. Denying evolution makes you, as Richard Dawkins put it, a history denier. Off topic now, since I mentioned Richard Dawkins, on his site there is a link where you can donate to the people in Haiti. I'm sure you all know they are in great suffering now and 
they are in need for all the help they can get. I will put the link in the sidebar, so please, if you can, go support them in this tragedy. That's it. Please leave me a comment and tell me if you found this video helpful or boring or whatever the case may be. Oh, and tell me if you're interested in a video with the evidence for the Big Bang Theory. So, thanks for watching. Check out the sidebar. Peace out.